So welcome to my talk about um, <coughs> about OpenHPC. Um, so my my name is um, Adrian Rebo. I work for Red Hat. I'm actually I'm in in the core kernel team, and I'm working on um, checkpoint restore, container migration. But because I was doing checkpoint restore before joining Red Hat in HPC, I'm also doing now. Um, I'm, I'm Red Hat's um, representative in, in the OpenHPC project, and I want to give an overview here um, what OpenHPC is, what it does, why it exists. Um, so my, 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 my agenda is, um, I first want to give a high-level view why, um, um, and what OpenHPC is, the next step, I want to um, say why OpenHPC exists. Um, I guess most people know the problems uh, which OpenHPC tries to solve. Um, and then I want to talk about, again, what OpenHPC is. Um, I want to focus more on um, how the project is set up and what, what the goals are. And then I want to talk again what OpenHPC is and giving details about what it actually includes and what you can take um, out of it. And if, and if there's some time at the end, I, I want to talk about um, what we are currently discussing in our, in our meetings. So um, what is OpenHPC? Um, if, you, if, you, if you just look at it at a first glance, it seems to be a software repository. There are bunch of RPMs you can easily install on your system and you can install it you, you can install those RPMs using yum or zipper which means it supports right now CentOS 7 and slash 12 it's for um, x86 64 architecture and, and the ARM 64 architecture the, the actual use users are mostly as expected, not on ARM, but on the um, x86 architecture. And that's that's what OpenHPC is, if you have a first look at it. At least that's, that's what, what I saw. So um, the, the topic, why OpenHPC? Why does it exist? Um, this is probably one of the same reasons why, why also EasyBuild exists. So in, in the HPC environment, you have multiple compilers you need to install on your system. You have multiple MPIs you need to install on your system in multiple versions. And if you have three different compilers from three different vendors and two version, versions each, you already have like six different, different compilers. And if you combine this with the MPIs, you have a lot of almost same software you need to install, almost the same steps, and this is something um, which which many um, HPC sites actually do today. So um, OpenHPC was was the idea to kind of solve those things in a collaborative way. Um, back to my point, what is OpenHPC about the project, how it's set up? Um, it's a community effort to reduce those mentioned uh, duplications which each HPC site has to solve in some kind of way, whatever they use to do it. And when the project was uh, formed, there uh, was a, there's a, a, a mission and a vision statement. This is the vision statement. It's, it's a, like, like a vision statement, it has to be. It's, it's visionary. Um, it tries to formulate somehow that through collaboration, OpenHPC wants to help um, to have easier setup of an HPC system, easier administration, easier starting if you're completely new to the topic also. And uh, the mission statement, I think it's a bit, has, has some clearer goals. Um, it's a it's a collection of open source software in a repository which is easy to install and in addition to the software it provides it just it just it doesn't want just to provide software but also um, best practices 
ideas how you could um, install or manage your system. The um, OpenHPC project is a Linux Foundation project. Um, this is the, I think these are all current members, maybe some more. Um, it changes all the time. There are new members all the time. It's a, it's a combination of, of industry partners who are providing tools, software, hardware for um, HPC system, as well as universities, which are all bringing their knowledge together to formulate what OpenHPC wants to um, wants to do. Um, the, I think the, the, the governing structure of OpenHPC is similar to what a lot of um, Linux Foundation projects are doing. We have, a, we have a governing board, we have a technical steering committee which um, has a meeting each week or every second week, depends if, if, it's, if it's necessary. And, um, and in the TSC meeting we discuss um, what we want to change what we need to change, and this is the, the committee where we try to find um, how to move forward. Um, maybe this is interesting for some of you, the, um, the membership is free for academic partners, so if you're interested in joining OpenHPC, um, you can talk to us and we're happy to collaborate with um, any more partners which are interested in OpenHPC. So this is the list of the current uh, TSC members, so from a lot of those um, institutions or companies, there's someone involved somehow in, in OpenHPC. And one important thing which I, I think I, which, which needs to be pointed out is that um, OpenHPC doesn't force you what you have to install and how you have to install your system. It's, it's, about, it's about building blocks. You can pick and choose what you want and install the software the way you want it on your system. It doesn't, there are certain parts which you have to do if you want to use OpenHPC, but it tries to be as, as open and, and free as possible so you can adapt it to your local needs. So you can either install um, the binary RPMs, you can modify those RPMs for your local needs, you can use any of the documentation in any way you want, so it, it doesn't force a special um, setup on you, so this is one of the important parts of OpenHPC, I think. Um, some information about the project history. The first discussions about OpenHPC were held at IC 2015, and the first release of OpenHPC, which is probably somewhere here, um, is was in um, at Supercomputing 2015, and since then there are continuous continuous new releases every quarter, and and each release contains more content than the previous release. Currently, um, the latest release, which was released at Supercomputing 2018, is 1.3.6, and we are currently working on 1.3.7. Um, this is the number of components, so it grows slowly. There's not a, a, a large number of um, software packages we have, but it's, it's a, from our point of view, it's a basic, um, software set which makes sense from our point of view um, for uh, to, to get a, an HPC system running. Um, this is an overview how much changed between the releases. So um, changed means added or updated. So it's most of the time around 30% I would say. Um, some statistics, how many visitors per month the build system gets. Um, the package repository access we see um, per, per month unique visitors. So you can see uh, they usually switch to the new versions. Our user as soon there is a new version. Now the latest statistics somehow, um, someone started 
for a large number of people started to using the old release. We, we are not sure yet why this happens, but um, more visitor statistics. And this is the data downloaded from our um, build system. Um, and then back to my, my thing, what, what is OpenHPC now in, in detail? Um, what it is, um, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a software repository and it includes different packages. Um, the basis of all is, is LMOD, um, which we are using for, for the environment modules. The reason why we are using um, the Lua-based implementation is that, as far as I know, this is developed at TEC, um, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, and TEC is part of OpenHPC, and that's how the connection is between um, LMOD and, and OpenHPC. It has advantages for, for the OpenHPC project because we have um, really, really close contact with the uh, developers of LMOD, so there's a um, close exchange and they can easily help us uh, fix things or provide new features which OpenHPC needs um, for, for the software management. Then it includes um, provisioning tools like Werewolf, there's XCAT, then there's monitoring, Nagios, Ganglia, then we have resource managers, PBS Pro, Slurm, compilers, of course, GCC, LLVM. There is support for the Intel compiler, so we don't distribute the Intel compiler, of course. You have to have it on your system already, but if you have it, OpenHPC will detect it. And all packages which OpenHPC provides are also available compiled with the Intel compiler. So if you have locally the Intel compiler installed, you get the, the complete OpenHPC stack compiled with the Intel compiler. The same goes for the ARM HPC compiler, which will be probably part of the next release, 1.3.7. It's also, um, you have, you have to, to buy it from ARM directly. Then we have um, the usual MPIs. And then we have, um, spec for more software, easy build for more software. Um, this is one point where we know we cannot provide the same amount of software that easy build and spec can. So we, we stop at, at some level where we say we want to provide a certain amount of packages which people can use to install a kind of minimal system or at least a, an HPC system which gets you running and then on top of it, there can be other tools which can um, complete the, the, the full software stack, which, which we cannot in, in our group um, provide with the necessary, um, I don't know, bug fixes or, or um, make sure it actually works good enough. Therefore, our community is not, not big enough and the people involved right now. We have a few... Um, Container runtimes included, Charlie Cloud, Singularity, then there are file systems, um, clients, the Lustre client and BGFS clients are part of it, and lots of the usual libraries which you see and on, on an HPC system. But it's important to know that OpenHPC is not just a software repository. It tries, one of the mission or vision statement includes that it wants to um, not just provide software, but also best practices. And, and OpenHPC comes with, in my view, excellent documentation for an open source project. This was one of the points when I first looked at it. it it's really documented completely. And documentation, I mean, it's um, the documentation how you um, would set up your cluster. And the docu documentation is for every combination of provisioner, resource manager, operating system, CPU architecture. So for all those combinations, you get a different um, documentation. And when I say including recipes, so part of the documentation is all the commands you have to type in into your shell to get your cluster running, to install the software, to provision the, the, all the clients. And the recipes are basically just all those shell commands put into one large cell, shell script and you can run it and hopefully you have a working HPC system at the end. And also one thing I, I, I like about the project is 
with every release, all those um, documentation steps are actually tested. We have um, a bare metal cluster where we install all our software packages and the operating system like we describe it in our documentation to make sure that the documentation actually works. So um, er every, everything is actually tested to make sure it gets you a running HPC system. And once you have it installed, you get the same interface um, independent of the operating system, of the architecture. So the user will always see the same module names and files, so he doesn't have to change any paths if he's using an, an op open HPC um, system. <coughs> Then I want to talk about some upcoming changes. The next release will be uh, 1.3.7. It will be available somewhere in the next three months. Um, it will include the usual updates for, of all the packages um, which can be updated. And the goal is to include the, the ARM HPC compiler so that all packages are rebuilt with the compiler from ARM. Um, what we just started to discuss um, last week in our meeting is um, support for new operating system releases. Um, there's um, slash 12 avail slash 15 available, um, which we want to support, um, or wh where we are thinking about supporting. Then there's the RHEL 8 beta available, so we also started to look into um, what changes are necessary to um, get OpenHPC running on, on, on RHEL 8 and maybe CentOS 8 and at some point. And the, the um, important thing here is from our release numbering, this would mean we would go to a 1.4 release. So as long as we, so at some point we changed our release numbering and said we will stay on 1.3 point something as long as the user can just upgrade the packages without any reinstallation. And if we go to um, new operating system releases, it, it would mean we would need a new release, which is just a number, wouldn't be so bad. But the problem is, at that point, it would mean we have to support like four releases, four operating system releases. And right now, we are not sure that our community can handle um, four operating system releases because we are already um, have enough to do to make sure that for the currently two supported version releases we um, we can we can actually um, test it and if we have four we are not sure how to really do it so this as, as I said this would require um, double would double the required testing so um, this is currently being discussed, and when we switch and how we switch, we don't know it yet. Um, so, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. So, um, when I um, when I tried to um, to um, to build uh, OpenHPC on, on the RHEL 8 beta. There were two um, interesting things I hit um, which may make the life of um, users or soft, uh, uh, people providing the software for the system a bit more interesting than it used to be. So there's, there's a new thing called, called Anobin. Um, it provides annotation in the binaries and the problem is it's a, it's a GCC plugin and the, def the default RPM optimization flex enable it. And if you install a second GCC or a second compiler like we do and you recompile all your RPMs with your own compiler which doesn't have um, the Anobin plugin, um, it, it gets complicated to disable it. So this is a, a thing where we are currently I'm not sure how to uh, handle it, if we should just enable it or provide our own Anobin plugin for the, um, for the plugins of, for our, for our um, GCC 
and and the other big thing is is, is Python three. So we have uh, a lot of packages which still depend on Python two, and um, we are not yet sure how uh, in how far RHEL eight and CentOS eight will support Python 2, if, if it will at all. So we, we don't know it yet, and so we currently um, disabled all packages which are requiring um, Python 2. This is a lot because it's basically it's um, at least, um, when I tried it, there was singularity was not working, it was not possible to build PBS Pro, it was not possible to build Slurm, so this is our a lot of our low-level packages, which are necessary to build a complete stack, we're not, uh, we were not able to build. So um, we're hoping that the upstream projects are making the move to Python 3, so we can support almost um, the same flag, um, same software stack as we used to. So this this will be one of the interesting things we somehow need to solve. And. Another thing which, which I find interesting is um, we are using um, RPM coloring. So the, the problem is if you install additional software um, using RPM like we do, oh, it seems like I'm missing a slide. <laughs> so, um, so so in, in the end we, we install, uh, it, what, what, what could happen is that OpenHPC installs the same software as the operating system, so same MPI or same GCC or at least, or for example, um, where I saw it um, first was, was OpenBlast. So we, we are installing the same package built with a different compiler, but the result um, for RPM will be the same because the, the shared object name is the same from the operating system um, package as with the open HPC package. And if RPM or better YUM does its um, dependency resolution, it can install one or the other package. And if you just install everything, it's, it's okay. But if you install uh, the open HPC stack, so you have open, uh, open blast example, uh, in ex um, as example from, from open HPC, and then you install some um, package from the operating system which requires OpenBlast, the, 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 um, the dependency resolution will say, I already have the shared object symbol in my RPM database. I don't need in, to install it again, the package. And, but if you, if you then actually run the software, it will not find it because you have to do module load before and and uh, the operating system doesn't know anything of module load. So anyway, what we do, we just append to all our um, symbols, which are in the RPM database, we append a string called OHPC to make sure that our shared objects are different from the operating system object. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is an overview um, of where you can find us and uh, what we do, we have a, we work on GitHub. We have you can ha look at the, our build system. That is where you can download all our packages, and you can have a look at our CI testing to see what we test. Um, like I described it, there's a there's a wiki and there's a mailing list where we discuss stuff. And at this point, I'm already in the end. And thank you for your time. I have a, I have a small question. Uh, when you say Singularity was not compiling on uh, Rail 8, you mean the 2.6 version? I don't know, some version. The version at that time, I don't know. This okay, like because the new Singularity version is not Python dependent. Oh, it was some, some build dependency, I don't know. Somewhere. Yeah, I guess you were trying to build the, the last year yeah, could could be. I, I just built it what was in the open HPC repository and it didn't work.
do you have much of an idea of how many people actually use uh, the uh, open HPC so so from from the statistics um, I, I don't know a few thousand at least <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, we don't know do, do people get in touch right do people get in touch with problems or like as regards to documentation and things like that I mean you say everything is heavily documented like do people say oh, this is not quite correct or this, this, this happens thing. sometime, but it's it's not very often. The most uh, feedback we actually get is at, at ISC and SC, where people come by and they say we use it; it's great. So we, it, that's that's kind of the interesting thing. We do not get very much um, negative feedback. So this is it seems like it's uh, it solves the problem of some people. How do you uh, integrate easy build in this open HPC um, environment? Do you do some special things to make it easier to use it? He probably knows better, Kenneth. He, he, he's, he's doing the easy build package, actually. Okay, so the, there's an existing spec file to install or to create a package for easy build, which I try to update every time there's a new release. I still have to do it for Tuesday's release. Um, so you basically get an RPM for easy build that installs easy build and installs a module for easy build. Um, there's a, a metadata file in the easy build release for open HPC that tells easy build about the open HPC packages. So you can make easy build use the op open API, for example, installed through open HPC through one of the packages that is provided. It probably needs an update um, for the latest open HPC releases, but you can you can let easy build leverage the packages you can install through open hpc so it knows about it already maybe it needs a bit of an update but it, all the mechanisms are there so you don't have to reinstall open mpi if you already have it through open hpc so there's a bit of integration there there's probably more that can be done and this is some of one of the things i wanted to discuss with adrian this week uh, but yeah it hasn't happened yet there's other ways maybe the open hpc project can leverage easy build to generate packages or update packages or it's, it could be an option to me this this last bit i think it makes a lot of sense because you have you have easy build or you have a spark which can generate all this huge amount of packages ideally optimized so uh, I think there's a little bit of overlap between OH Open HPC and when they, the libraries that, that, that Open HPC provides, why not kind of get rid of that part and leverage the tools that are specialized in that, like you said, or Spark or, well, I think that's about it. Yeah, that, that would be ideal if we, if those projects somehow could work closer together so that we um, do not do the same steps um, again. I don't know. To me, you just you just think. I think it kind of makes sense to maybe within the Open HPC community to focus less on those libraries and maybe focus more on okay. So what is the for this particular infrastructure? What do you want to use? Want to use CCB? You want to use Spark? And from there on, start picking up the the libraries that uh, that you want to install and and use those tools for it. To me, I think it would be beneficial for for both open HPC, the users, and the Spark and the Sphere community. Yeah. So is there, um, is easy build any binary packages, which is provided as all source comp compiled from source? It has support to install stuff binary okay. as well. So yeah. It can do anything. Um, it, is it even has some support to create RPMs. Oh, okay. So this could be something that could be leveraged in open HPC, something we can look at together mm -hmm. at some point. I had a, does anyone else have questions? I have a couple, I'll ask one or two. The w one thing that you mentioned is, and I'm, I'm a bit surprised by what you said, you said in, in RHEL 8, it's not sure yet whether Python 2 will, will still be there. <laughs> in, it, I, it, I don't know. In I the beta, it's there and there's, I've seen blog posts by people at Red Hat that say we're gonna have to keep Python 2 at least initially yeah, but well I, I basically I know as much as you do. Okay. So yeah. so I, I personally wouldn't expect it to be there because it's... I agree. It's, it's, <laughs> it's end of life this year, yeah, so... It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, it's hard to believe that uh, it, it will be part of yeah. 
right. but on the other hand you also said that you run into lots of problems because you don't have Python 2 installed. Yes, right, yeah. So maybe that's a reason why Red Hat says, okay, we have to, at least initially. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I really don't know. An an another thing I've noticed is that, so LMOD is like the base for OpenHPC. All the packages come with a module. Mm -hmm, yeah. like, so people can do module load to <coughs> ac activate the package. But the, the modules that are included in OpenHPC are all in the, the TCL syntax. Yes, right, yeah. Is there a a good reason for that? Is it to keep it compatible with other modules tools in, peop in case people want to switch? No, no, no this, this wouldn't work because um, it includes already statements, I think, which... Um, which are specific to LMOD. Yes, yeah. like like out, um, automatically loading dependencies and, and things like this, which... Yeah. I, I actually don't know why it's still in the old uh, format. Maybe it's just what people are used to, yeah. something like this. I think it's worthwhile looking into switching to Lua because there's an overhead that the yeah, right. modules are in Tickle. Like yeah. LMOD does like translation mm. of Tickle to Lua before it even loads the module. So it made things a, a bit slower and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're tied to LMOD anyway. Then yeah, right, right. Then, yeah. Um, maybe one more. You mentioned that your documentation is being well tested before doing the actual release to make sure that everything is still fine. Is that automated or yeah, is it? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's um, so it, it like the that's, that's on 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 the on the Jenkins on the in the CI infrastructure you can see there and all the testing is um, I think also part of the OpenHPC repository so yeah. you can see uh, where it installs the systems and then boots them up. How, how does that work in the documentation? That all the commands that have to be run are in a certain order and are marked somehow that they can be extracted or or it's just a bunch of scripts that are in line in the documentation? How does that work? I think I, I never actually looked, but I think it's it's the like like you just uh, said in, in the first step. So it's it's all in in LaTeX, and it can be it's written a way it can be extracted from the from the documents into a shell script. So this was, and it's um it's 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 modular. So if you if you do the installation for PBS Pro and and Serum, all the documents uh, which are then above the scheduler um, are then from the same source. So it's it's okay. written only once and just constructed together that it fits. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Adrian.